Um, I have a nine-year-old son with Down syndrome. Um, I have a passion for this like the Leahy's do. Um, like the Leahy's, I'm a parent. Um, 10 years from uh, this December, my son will be 10 years old. Um, before he was born, I actually had no interest in any disability issues. I had no reason to have any interest in any disability issues other than friends I had or family members, none of which had the greatest disability perhaps was, a, was having glasses. So this is a new world for me um, and I appreciate the Leahy's for all they do. Um, I thank them on behalf of my son who cannot thank them and I thank you for being here and uh, taking advantage of what they give to you as far as an education so you can help people like my son. Thank you. Still Senator Casey isn't here. I'm going to have to get more emotional. Um, before introducing the Senator, why don't I start by letting you know who sits to my left here, okay? Um, first off is Michael Stower. Um, Michael, for those who were here earlier today, um, was one of the presenters today and did an excellent job. Michael works as an educational consultant for the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistant Network. It's commonly called Patan or Patton. I really never know how to pronounce that, that word right. Um, it's actually an arm or an initiative of the Pennsylvania Department of Education, the Bureau of Special Education, which is most apropos, obviously, and it supports the educational community by offering professional development that builds the capacity of local educational agencies to meet students' needs. And Michael comes to us by way of Duquesne University. Um, sitting next to him is uh, Mr. Hal Bloss. He's the incoming executive director in Luzerne County of Luzerne Intermediate Unit Number 18, effective this November. Um, Mr. Bloss received his superintendent's letter of eligibility from Temple University, a master's of education at Bloomsburg University, and his BS from uh, East Stroudsburg University, again, a non-university Scranton graduate. Um, He taught here, though. That's, he did mention that. Um, next to him is Mr. William Gannon. Mr. Gannon was appointed by Governor Ed Rendell and then Secretary of Labor and Industry Stephen Schmieren as the Executive Director of the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation in December of 2004. Um, Mr. Gannon also was a presenter this morning. And from the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation standpoint, I was um, I was quite impressed by the number of um, state and federal vocational rehabilitation programs that his office oversees. Um, Mr. Gannon comes to us by way of King's College, an old rivalry of the University of Scranton. We always beat them in basketball, though. And sitting next to him at his left is uh, Wendy Patterson. Wendy is the uh, statewide transition specialist for the Pennsylvania Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. She graduated from Shippensburg University with the Bachelor of Arts in Psychology. And prior to her tenure with the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, which began in March of 2008, she worked as a therapeutic support specialist um, and as a case manager in private rehabilitation. She currently manages transition initiatives supported by a grant through the Rehabilitation Services Administration. So we really assembled a, a nice panel today for the, for the transitional and the vocational issues that we need to address. And uh, I, I look forward to, to them. Let me start perhaps by asking a question of the panel. And then when we see Senator Casey come to the, to the chair, we can, we can in, invite him. And let me do this. I'm going somewhat off the, off the script, but that's why lawyers are paid the big money to be able to squirm in situations like this. Let, let me pr present some issues, because as I was sitting um, listening to the presenters today, and that word transition keeps happening, um, 
with, with any person with a disability or a special need, there's always transition going on. I recall when my son was born, we went to zero to three. I never knew an individual could be zero years old, but you go from zero to three. You go from three to five. You go to kindergarten. You go to middle school. You go to et cetera, et cetera. Now, the hardest transition I know, and I've been involved in parents of uh, uh, Down syndrome in Lackawanna County for years, is a lot of the friends I have who have children, particularly with Down syndrome, are now dealing with transition issues in high school and it's over, overwhelming for them. So not only do you deal with, with, with those transition issues, but you're dealing with, excuse me, the IEP that you dealt with all along, and all of a sudden you're dealing with the child and the life, and you don't have an IEP anymore. There's no IEP for getting a job. There's no IEP for going out. And I'd just like to go through the panel one by one from their vantage point, what, they, what they've seen with this. Michael? There you go. Um, one of the things I think it's really important in, in when we're working, uh, especially with families, and um, as I mentioned earlier in Pennsylvania, we start transition uh, at age 14, um, is you know really the recognition that um, it's really difficult for families, caregivers, um, and oftentimes for youth to start to think about at 14 the fact that um, we're, we're going to start discussing what you're going to do once you leave school. Um, and for families, it, it's oftentimes that uh, re-realization of uh, their sons or daughters have a disability and what's going to happen next. And I think it's important for us as professionals to really be compassionate about that. Um, and as we work through, um, you know, really doing uh, well thought out um, assessments, having that youth, that family actively engaged in that process and making those connections. Um, you know, within the education system as well as with our agency partners to ensure their success. Mr. Bloss. Good afternoon. I want to give everybody a lot of credit for being here after a long day. Uh, if I had to say some of the things, there's a number of issues that I that I see a transition in, and and Michael and I and Bill as we actually worked hand in hand for years together. Uh, forming partnerships with students uh, with disabilities in transition. And in your booklet, it says it takes a village to, to, to make these things happen. And, I, and I'd like to stress the fact that uh, what it takes, if more than anything else, is active engagement with partnerships and creating those partnerships to make sure that you have the safety nets in place to help these students. And the other thing that I'd like to say, uh, particularly because I see so many young people here, uh, transition typically by Pennsylvania Department of Education standards begins at age 14. But I would respectfully suggest to you that transition begins when you first identify that the student has a disability in the first before you're even starting the IP. You need to start thinking about where the student's abilities lie, where you're going to go, and what we can do to advocate for the student. Because the single most important strat uh, area, when they asked uh, people with disabilities what led them to be successful, they said uh, they were able to take responsibility for their decisions at an earlier age, and they practiced that. And it's the practice of self-determination and self-advocacy that gets them to that point of independence that they, be, that they be can become able to take advantage of those partnerships. So what I'd like to impress upon you is, is that from the moment that we start working with students, we always think about how we can increase their self-determination. Because if they can make choices for themselves, and take responsibilities for those choices, it gives them an increased opportunity to be successful and when they do have to face transition. And it begins through a series of processes that start very, very early on. So that's okay, Mr. one of my perspectives. Mr. Gannon? Having the microphone, I'll deviate just a, a quick instant. I just want to thank the interpreters today. If you think you're tired at the end of the day, think of what they've got to be doing. Uh, they've done a great job and carried a heavy load all day long. I think, I, I think it's important whether you're a parent, whether you're a friend uh, of a person with disability to recognize that transition isn't a word that applies simply to the disability community. We all go through transition. I can remember thinking, what is my mother doing? I'm, I'm six years old and she's leaving me in this building and going home. That was a transitional shock for me. First grade was probably more of a shock than graduating from high school. Uh, uh, we all go through transitions, 
and it's, uh, it's, it's difficult for everybody. It's difficult for any kid to leave home and start college. Uh, uh, it becomes that much more burdensome if you have uh, another load to carry as well. Uh, but I think we have to understand that it's, it's part of the normal process for everybody. And Ms. Patterson? Hello. Um, I think that all three of these gentlemen had excellent points. Um, I want to reemphasize what Hal said about empowerment, and we were actually uh, meeting yesterday and working on planning the conference, and we chose that as uh, one of the main focuses of the conference, and it's really true how without being empowered, uh, nothing else is really going to be effective. So. I'd like to reiterate that the self-determination is a crucial part of the process. Let, let me pose, um, in, in the audience I see, I think we have a lot of students. Can I, anyone who's a student raise their hand? Oh, that's nice. It, at the, pardon me? <laughs> now, a student, oops, a student at all. Now, let me ask anyone involved with an educational background or going for a major in education at all? We have a lot of uh, any um, OT, PT majors in that? Okay, that's, and rehab too. Any rehab, rehab majors too in that? Excellent, excellent. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with what's called IDEA, the Individual with Disabilities Education Act. And I'm sure you're going to, after you graduate, get out there and deal with a lot of issues, get into a lot of schools, and be providing a lot of services to a, to a lot of kids that, that really need them. And I really commend you for, for, for taking on that. One of the questions that was raised today, and was actually raised by Patricia Leahy at one point, was under um, idea about being able to uh, have transition services provided at age 14. And uh, Mrs. Leahy mentioned that they're going to amend as part of the amendments to allow the um, transition services start younger at age 14. And Michael Storer mentioned this morning that under the Pennsylvania regulations, this actually begins at age 14. So. I think that's important for everybody to know because you're actually going to be dealing with these, these kids early on through high school and, and just to be aware of it and you'll be there before you know it. Um, with that said, I think, do we have Senator Casey? Can you hear us, Senator? I, I, let's see, I want to make sure we can hear you, Senator. Try one more time. Keep touching. Okay, they, they, they tell me that you can hear us, Senator. That's better. Excellent job. There we go. Senator, welcome. Um, we're in the beautiful uh, the Naples Center on the University of Scranton campus on Mulberry Street, and we're actually in the Father Bernard McElhinney room, and I'm sure you remember Father, Father McElhinney very well from your Scranton days. Um, welcome, Senator. Thank you. 
HIV people with disabilities. And uh, I do want to thank and commend uh, uh, Ed Lee and, and Patricia for so much leadership in this area over many years. I've known them a long time, but I've never had the chance to fully appreciate the work uh, that's been done by, by um, Ed Lee and, and uh, so many others. So grateful for this, uh, this opportunity. And I wanted to just do a kind of a, a summary of some features of the bill, uh, and then maybe take some questions if we have some time. Uh, first of all, just a note on the process for, even for those who are following this, it gets, it gets complicated, and it gets complicated uh, from this vantage point as well. But we spent, we meaning, in this case, uh, some 20, uh, 22 members, uh, 23 voting members of the uh, Health, Education, Labor, Pensions Committee, the so-called HGLP or Health Committee, chaired by Senator Kennedy, but by the time we got to the, the, uh, the bill to, to really debate it and, and uh, make changes to it, uh, Senator Kennedy wasn't able to, uh, uh, to join us, and so it was really 22 people in and out of the room over the course of uh, several weeks and some 60 hours that was preceded by um, 25 or more hours of sitting down with both parties walking through the bill before we went to a formal markup or amendment process. So on, on, the, uh, on the, the, one of the foundational bills for what I believe will become healthcare reform, I already voted. I voted this summer to uh, move our bill out of the committee and it's an excellent bill in so many different uh, in so many different ways. It meets the not just the jurisdictional obligations uh, or responsibilities of the committee, but it dealt with the, the big issues that uh, we're trying to wrestle with in, in healthcare reform. It, it it focused on costs and how to save money, but also to do that in the context of wellness and better health outcomes uh, for for all Americans, especially those who are we were often left out of the uh, left out of the best features of our system. Uh, it also had, if you just look at it title by title, it very clearly uh, addresses a lot of the concerns that Americans have. Coverage concerns. That's the first section of the the bill. Coverage problems, like if you have a pre-existing condition, uh, insurance companies uh, discriminating against uh, against people because of a pre-existing condition, for example, is made illegal in the bill. It's the first provision in the bill. A very clear uh, sentence that, that, that makes that, uh, that problem a, a matter of, uh, or I should say, takes that problem away from the lives of a lot of Americans if we make, make that practice of denying coverage due to a pre-existing condition by insurance companies making that illegal. Limiting out of, exorbitant out-of-pocket costs and deductibles and co-pays. Uh, making it illegal for insurance companies to put a lifetime or yearly cap on benefits, for example. Uh, making it Ill illegal for insurance companies to discriminate against women, which unfortunately that's the harsh reality uh, of today's system, uh, the worst parts of today's, the, the system we have now. So the coverage section was comprehensive on, on so many. There's, there's a whole section on quality, improving the quality. Uh, we should no longer just point to good examples around the country. Everyone should have uh, the kind of quality standards that some, some hospitals, some health systems, some practitioners have, but not enough. Uh, there's a whole section on prevention, which I believe is essential in two ways. Number one, to have a healthier America and a healthier workforce and therefore a better economy, literally. But also, prevention in the sense of being able to save money. I mean, we can literally save money and save lives at the same time. Um, there's a whole section on workforce, which we have to ramp up very quickly because of the demands of our healthcare system and the, uh, the demographics of our uh, population, an aging population, but also uh, a population that's going to need the kind of quality health care that uh, a lot of our hospitals and health systems and doctors and nurses and others provide every day, uh, but are not provided the kind of incentives they should be provided with to, to improve quality and enhance uh, prevention. Um, there's a whole, a whole set of other sections which I'll go into, but what we're, what we're trying to do 
And what I believe we have to do, this isn't just a nice thing to do. We gotta do it. We gotta do it for two reasons at least. One, because of health care, and two, because of our economy and our long-term debt. We cannot, in any conceivable way, deal with long-term debt unless we begin to reform our health care system. So even if you didn't, even if you weren't focused on health care, if all you worried about was long-term debt, we gotta do this. And that's why we've been pushing so hard to get a to get a bill passed. Because you can't wrestle, or at least begin to wrestle those big costs uh, to the ground, so to speak, without uh, a health care bill. Uh, all the talk in Washington about debt and deficit uh, doesn't make much sense absent a health care bill. And that's the, the hard, cold reality of what we're facing. But we tried in our bill, and I think the Finance Committee tried uh, as well, to deal with the cost question. But we also have to enhance and preserve choices. That's why I think a public option is very important. And we should, despite all the, all the uh, to use an old phrase, crepe hangers, uh, it's, still, it's, it's still a debate that is ongoing, and it should be ongoing, because we want to give people choice, and we also want to inject more competition to bring down costs. So cost and, and, and choice are, are central elements of this, but they're also uh, related. We also want to enhance quality, as I said before. And, and basically what we're trying to do here is to say to, to say to the American people when it comes to the worries about uh, those with coverage, we want to say to them, we, we want you to be able to keep what you have and to preserve your choice. In other words, the, the treatment you need from the doctor you choose. It, sh it should be that simple. But we also want to make sure at the same time that uh, we're protecting uh, those with insurance and helping those without insurance. Some people with insurance think they're pretty secure. They are not. Uh, when an insurance company can deny you coverage because of a pre-existing condition, you are not secure. When an insurance company can jack up your premiums uh, virtually without without any kind of uh, uh, any kind of uh, a check on that power, you are not secure. So for all the reasons that we've outlined here today, it's essential for those with insurance to be given more security and stability. If there are two words I'd, I'd speak about those with insurance, it's security and stability. Now how about those without insurance? Uh, well, first of all, the, those with insurance think covering those without insurance is somehow going to cost them more. It's costing them right now. Every single person in America that has insurance today is paying lots of money to, to compensate for those who don't have insurance. By one estimate, it's 900 bucks a person in Pennsylvania and over 1,000 bucks a person uh, nationally. So we, covering those without insurance is, all, is also good for those with insurance. And we're finally uh, understanding that here in Washington. It takes us a little while sometimes. But those without insurance, of course, we're trying to provide uh, quality, uh, affordable options uh, for them. Let me talk for a moment in particular about, about uh, Americans uh, with disabilities. One of the best features of our bill, it's got no air time. And I say none, I mean almost none, because it's not controversial. And it's not, uh, uh, it's not the stuff they like to cover. But the... Uh, uh, and it's a, it's a legacy, as much of our health care uh, public policy is, it's a legacy of Senator Edward M. Kennedy. Uh, one part of the bill that he worked hard on for many, many years, and his staff did for many years, and we have to make sure that we get this done as well, is what's known as the CLASS Act, C-L-A-S-S, the Community Living Assistance Services and Supports Act. Drop right in the middle of our bill, because it, it does a number of things. Basically what it does, and I'm just going to read a, a, a basic description because no one's talking about this, and I know you, you may have been talking about it today, but I want, want people to hear this. It's a new national insurance program to help adults who have, uh, have, who have or develop functional impairments to remain independent. Uh, a very important theme that a lot of you have been, been a part of and enunciated and worked on for years, but now we can put it into a uh, a part of our bill. Um, we want to make sure that those with those impairments remain independent uh, and who happen to be employed and, and we want them to stay part of our community. We don't want to say to someone 
who has some limitation or some, uh, some impairment that, that might slow them down a little bit, we don't want to say to them, you're not going to be part of our employment. You're not going to be part of our, uh, our economy. This new program is financed through voluntary payroll deductions. Uh, it'll remove barriers to independence and choice uh, uh, by having housing modifications, assistive technologies, uh, personal assistance services, transportation, by providing a cash benefit to individuals unable to perform two or more functional activities of daily life. The large risk pool created will make uh, added coverage more affordable and reduce incentives for people uh, with severe impairments to spend down to Medicaid. Uh, for those who care only about cost, this program is paid for. In fact, it's one of the crystal clear areas of our healthcare debate where in fact we've identified something that's paid for. So that someone who has uh, the desire and the opportunity to go to work every day should have to stay uh, home and not work if we can give them just a little bit of help after they've uh, paid into a paid into a program. So we'll talk more about that, but it's it's a very important part of our bill. It starts at about section 3201 of the uh, the help bill if you wanted to go th further through it. Um, let me just make a couple more points about the, the bill overall. The, uh, uh, the idea of an exchange, which you've heard a good bit about, uh, we call it a gateway in our bill, but it's basically the same concept where people can go to a marketplace to compare prices and compare options or benefits. Uh, obviously, that's going to help uh, a lot of people who either don't have a lot of choices and, and have to deal with a lot of gobbledygook and confusing uh, language in, in the insurance world. The exchange, I think, will help that. It'll allow people to compare prices and plans so they can decide uh, which option is best for them. The, uh, the bill also will, would expand the Medicaid program uh, to more people uh, with disabilities. This expansion to 133%. 133% uh, of poverty, which is uh, which works out to about a little more than $14,400 for an individual, will assist low-income adults who have disabilities but do not meet the stringent requirements of the SSI uh, Supplemental Social Security Income Program to receive uh, Medicaid coverage. Uh, I think that's vitally important. The worst thing we could do uh, in the course of reforming or attempting to reform health care is to put those with uh, uh, the Americans with disabilities or those who happen to be poor or special needs children or any any other vulnerable group to put them at a greater disadvantage after the bills passed than they were before. So we have to watch very carefully, especially when people want to make changes to uh, uh, changes to the uh, the, Medi the uh, Medicaid program. Medicare uh, Part D, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to be late for that, so. Uh, the, uh, uh, Medicare Part D, the, uh, the, the reform plan would help people with disabilities eligible for Medicare Part D coverage through an agreement with the, believe it or not, the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> Who would ever believe that a couple years ago? Uh, and I'm serious about that. It's, it is a, a significant advancement that we're We've got players at the table on healthcare reform that wouldn't wouldn't even get not just get to the table they wouldn't go in the same house uh, with with uh, some of us to discuss these things. Um, this agreement with the pharmaceutical industry will provide individuals who hit the the so-called donut hole. We've heard a lot about that over the last couple of years. Basically, 2,700 bucks to 4,350 for 2009. People who fall within that that uh, uh, category or in the so-called donor poll. Here's how it helps. A discount of 50, uh, of at least, I should say, 50% for medication costs while you're in that gap, a $2,700 uh, to 4350 uh, This could save some individuals thousands of dollars. And again, we haven't heard a lot about this because it's good news. It's not controversial enough to get in the newspaper. But, um, Health insurance reform overall, I believe, will assure uh, 
accessible, quality, affordable uh, health care for people with disabilities, as well as many others uh, in our society who don't have, who don't either have coverage or don't have the uh, the security and stability they should have a right to expect. Let me let me just conclude with this thought. Two 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 related thoughts. One is. A lot of this debate and a lot of what we're trying to do here is not complicated, in my judgment. Not complicated. I know we hear, oh, it's complicated. And, oh, it's confusing. Well, you know what? Uh, we, meaning the American people, in one way or another, are experts at health care. We all know what it's like to go to the doctor. We all know what it's like to be sick uh, or ill or have someone we love who is sick or ill. Some know a lot more about it than I do. Uh, some know more than others because of horrific circumstances you've had to live through. So you're you're an expert on what it means to deal with the healthcare system. We know what it's like to deal with an insurance company. We know what it's like to deal with claim forms and, and the paperwork. We know what it's like to deal with good doctors and good nurses and, and good hospitals, and with rare exception. Okay. So that all this idea that this is too complicated to tackle, that we don't know what we're we're not sure what we're doing, we know a lot. For example, we know exactly what works in prevention. There's no mystery about it. The bookshelves are full of books about what works. We just got to make sure we take it off the bookshelf and put it into the law. We know exactly what a pre-existing condition, bar to coverage or treatment, does to one person, to one family. We know exactly how to cure that. You make that practice illegal. It's very simple, not complicated. It's one sentence, the first sentence in our bill. We know exactly what works in quality measures. We have major corporations, major health systems. I won't name all of them because we get in trouble when we name them. But lots and lots of empirical data that wasn't figured out in the halls of government. It was figured out in the private sector and in the, in the healthcare sector, in hospitals around Pennsylvania and around the country. They figured this out on prevention and on quality. There's no mystery to it. But we've got to make it part of the law. We've got to incentivize it. So instead of holding up these great examples that we say great things about, and I'll commend all of them, but I'm a little sick and tired of commending a few people or a few institutions for doing the right thing. We all should do the right thing on prevention, on quality, on best practices, on reducing uh, infections, on reducing readmissions, on, on dealing with multiple chronic diseases, the main driver of our cross. We know exactly what to do here. What, what's complicated is getting politicians to do the right thing. That's a little complicated because you have to be an expert in human nature sometimes and, and political acumen to get that done. But this is not all that complicated, folks. We also know it's a lot about how to control costs. Not a mystery. We know how to do this as Americans. And look, if this were, if we were a different country, I wouldn't be as confident. But Americans have figured out a lot more, uh, a lot of things substantially more complicated than healthcare over the last 50 to 100 years. If you think think about the wars we've fought, the diseases we've cured, the problems we have tackled, that they said we couldn't uh, defeat or, or, uh, uh, or, or cure or, or solve, uh, we would have, uh, you know, we would have just uh, uh, sat back and not uh, maybe engage in the fights and, and, and gain the knowledge and gain the, the, the answers to questions that we have over over many decades. So I think we can figure this out. And finally, let me, let me make a point about government. I have a lot of uh, town meetings, spoke to thousands and thousands of people in Pennsylvania. And whenever someone would, would say that, that uh, this is a government takeover or that somehow government health care is bad, I would present the following information. And we get, there are a lot of ways to say this, but we, have, we don't have a French system right now. We don't have a Canadian system. We don't have a, a system that's based upon some other country. And we don't have a system that is purely private. We got a mixed system right now, a, a mixture of both government health care and private sector health care, mostly private sector health care. And I think that's not going to change too much. But when you add up the number of Americans who have government health care right now, there are, there, there are uh, about, by my count, at least 115 million people in the three, these three uh, programs. Medicaid, about 60 to 61 million at last count. Medicare, 45 million. 
and almost eight million in VA healthcare. I didn't mention the Children's Health Insurance Program, which is kind of a hybrid of, of both government help and, and private sector health care. So we got a lot of people who get very good health care in government run or, or, or at least in government uh, affiliated systems. We also have a lot of people in the private sector who like their health care. They like their plan and they're gonna, they're, they should be allowed to, uh, to hold on to that. So we have an American system right now and that's not going to change very much as a result of health care reform. What will change, I believe, is we'll make both systems better. Both systems more accountable, public and private, make them both more accountable, make them both, insist that they both engage in better quality, better prevention, better cost control, and deliver better, both better health care and better bottom line for uh, taxpayers and for patients and their families. We can get this right, and we have to get it right. We cannot move away from this challenge and pass it on to another generation because make no mistake about it, if we don't do it this year, it's going to be a lot of years before uh, we get this done. So we want to do the right thing on health care in particular. We want to do the right thing with regard to Americans with disabilities. Thank you very much. Senator, before I see if anyone in the audience has any questions, perhaps I'll take the privilege of asking you the, uh, the first question. Um, we've, we've been talking a lot about transition today. Um, transition from school to work. And for most Americans, a job is a vehicle for health insurance. Um, it's not an obstacle as those with uh, disabilities. And let me tell you why, and let me tell you what I have seen here today from the presenters um, that talked a lot about transition. To those with disabilities who cannot find entry-level work that provides health insurance, government options are the only options today. People with disabilities cannot get private market health insurance because the premiums are too high, the exclusions on coverage for certain necessary treatment, or there's outright refusal to sell a policy to someone who has a pre-existing condition. Yet unfortunately, Senator, at the same time, Medicaid's asset and income limits prevent many workers with disabilities from qualifying. For example, taking a job that pays enough to live on means losing access to health coverage. Work is obviously a crucial part of all our lives, especially those in the disability community. To those with disabilities, Senator, work defines their identities, their social circles, their role in society, and their sense of self-respect. My question, and I think it's the question of a lot of people here today at this conference, is, is this disabled population being considered in the healthcare legislation, or are they still going to be caught in the so-called trap preventing them from finding and holding employment for fear of being without health insurance. Senator? Yeah, Joe, I don't think there's any question that in the course of, uh, I don't profess to be an expert on the, the, uh, uh, the every detail of what the Finance Committee is still wrestling with, and they're about to vote, we hope, in the next day or two, but uh, what we try to do in our bill is to, is to pay very close attention uh, to uh, uh, a lot of Americans, and, and including those with, with uh, disabilities, by making sure, as I, I mentioned before on the Medicaid, uh, the, the Medicaid program, expanding the, the, uh, the expansion on the percent of poverty to 133% um, to assist uh, those who have any both, be both low income and uh, people with, with uh, disabilities. Uh, it may be that we have to uh, spend even more time over the course of the next couple of weeks when we're, when this bill, and I should have said this before, the Finance Committee bill and our bill will be merged very soon. That will happen quickly, and then you'll have a bill that will go to the floor. Uh, we have to get a vote to get it to the floor in the complexity of the Senate, but getting the bill to the floor, and then there'll be uh, lots and lots of amendments uh, at that point. So it may be that once we see the merger of both our bill and the, and the Finance Committee bill, that, that uh, people in the audience and on the panel today, as well as others around the country, 
may say, well, you didn't quite get it right uh, in terms of what happened to uh, uh, people with disabilities as it relates to Medicaid. And we should, we, I want to be as available as, as possible to be responsive to those, uh, to those concerns. But I think between the Medicaid changes as well as uh, Medicare Part D, which I think is a pretty significant uh, change in terms of saving people money in the donor role, as well as potentially uh, those who are working who have some some uh, barriers in their way because of their disability, I think the Class Act will, uh, will help as well. Can I ask if there's any questions um, from the audience? Anyone have a question for the Senator? You want to you know, Joe, I can probably take, only take one because I'm the majority leader wants a couple of us in his office, and I'm already late. He's okay. on time. One question. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ed Ryan. Uh, this idea of expansion of the Medicaid universe, I'm a case manager for people with disabilities. Uh, this expansion of the universe of people with um, uh, disabilities into Medicaid, that is wonderful. Uh, I have, along with my colleagues, an extremely difficult time getting people with Medicaid access to any physicians, let alone specialists in this area. I don't know if that's national or whatever, but they can have Medicaid, but they can't see doctors. You mean access to physicians, you said? That's correct, and many of them have been dropped from physicians' care. Yeah, let me, uh, let us do this. I don't, I don't have a direct answer for you, but we can, we can certainly find out whether we've addressed that in our bill, technically, the, the, the mechanics of Medicaid in terms of uh, uh, the, the expansion to 133% poverty and the mechanics of how the program works is mostly and almost exclusively under the jurisdiction of the Finance Committee, although we spoke to it. But uh, we, can, we can find out whether or not there are uh, ways to provide greater access to, uh, to physicians. One thing I do know that is part of our Part of the bill overall, and this may speak to those who are on Medicaid who, who have uh, have uh, one or more disabilities, um, that um, we, we have it in, in, in a general sense in the bill. We're trying to develop a system uh, throughout our healthcare system where everyone. This is the ideal. It take us a while to work up to this, but the ideal and the goal of having. Uh, every American who has in health insurance coverage has a primary care physician. That's the goal. And, we, and I know we have a shortage of, of primary care physicians. We've got to figure that out through recruiting and incentives and, and, and other strategies. In addition to a primary care physician, we talk at length about community health teams, medical home model, all of those phrases that you know and have, have experience with, so that every American has, not only has a primary care physician, who deals with them a lot and knows them the best, but is kind of a, for lack of a better word, a quarterback, to be able to, to interact with and, and, and direct, uh, uh, direct uh, uh, a person to various levels of, uh, of expertise and, and uh, access to other doctors who are specialists. So that's the, the model that, that one person, every person I should say, should be surrounded by a team, not just one doctor who might be able to make a referral, might not, and who doesn't, doesn't, isn't able to, to communicate almost literally, if not through the wonders of technology through, uh, about a particular patient to specialists, to, not, not just to make that connection, but to get treatment quickly, not, not months and months and months and years later. So that's the ideal, and I think it will have an impact on, on everyone, not just, uh, not just those who are, uh, uh, not just those who are low income or people with disabilities. Senator, I, I will let you go. I thank you very much on behalf of the entire conference of the ladies and uh, good luck with the legislation. Joe, thank you very much and thank, thank the panel and uh, everyone for your attention. And I'm sorry I went a little long. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. The, uh, I was, was going to pose one other question to the senator and perhaps I'll, I'll pose it to the, the panel. Some of them are involved in, in education and, and it comes more as a, as a lawyerly question. When you talk about health care legislation, you don't necessarily have to agree or disagree with anything that's in the legislation, but the question becomes, 
is do we need health care legislation? Now, why I ask this is if you look back, you say there's various civil rights um, um, laws that have been created, created specifically for dealing with people with disabilities. We talked before about IDEA, the Individual with Disabilities Education Act. That has to particularly deal with children with special needs and getting a free and appropriate public education and being provided the right support and the right services. You have another thing called the Section 504, the Rehabilitation Act, which also has to deal with not being able to discriminate against anyone, basically. In, in a nutshell, it applies to schools, it applies to hospitals. Then you have the, um, obviously, the American with Disabilities Act under Title II and III. It particularly addresses accessibility, being able to have ability to access A, B, and C. It applies to schools, it applies to hospitals, it, it applies to public places. The logical question that seems to follow, though, when you're dealing with people with disabilities who all have a common dream of want to be included, like included in a classroom, who want to be integrated, who want to work, why do you go to school? You go to school to learn to work. The logical question becomes, is it a civil rights issue that we're dealing with in order to bring health care legislation to the forefront? And I think that's a, a crucial question. It was obviously going to be my, my next one of the senator, but I, I think I know what his answer would be, and I, I'd appreciate any comment from the panel on that. Mr. Gannon? I think you're, uh, you're right on track with, with the question. I think there are two overriding issues that, that, that really need to be addressed. Uh, it, you know, I, I don't disagree with anything that the, that the senator said in terms of there, there being right issues that need to be addressed. But it seems to me that you automatically continue those with paying for those without until the system is universal. Uh, and a universal is what you would refer to as a civil right. If it's a civil right, then it needs to be universal, or we are criminally treating a certain class of individuals uh, in the nation. Once you have a universal system, which means everybody has access to, quote, the system, do you then maintain one system, or do you have one system that everybody has an access to, and another system that those with wealth can buy? Because if you have two systems, one with wealth, one that wealth can buy, and one that everybody else gets, again, you don't have a resolve to the problem. And, and I don't believe that the, the health care issue is ever going to be resolved in, in, in any bill coming up for action or in the long run until those issues of universality and, uh, and uh, equality of care are addressed in whatever that bill is. But personal opinion. <laughs> any, any other comments from the panel? Just to kind of Michael. piggyback, I'm sorry, on um, what Mr. Gannon was saying. I, I think when we talk about education, we talk about faith and free appropriate education. It's the same thing with health care, and it's free appropriate health care for everyone. And it's, that's kind of the equalizer in education. It should be the equalizer in health care. Um, and when we look at and just to tie this into transition, I think in the whole idea of working in a community, looking at our allies, looking at our partners. Um, Senator uh, Casey had mentioned uh, about a medical home project, and the Department of Health is a, a key player um, on our transition team at the state and local level, and, and that is a model. And it doesn't mean necessarily throwing more dollars at the system. The system is in place. I mean, he was saying, you know, things are simple. Well, they are, but it's taking a step back and looking at it, making the connections, seeing what makes the most sense. Um, and again, you know, equipping our, our young folks with the tools and tools being healthcare so they can be successful. Let me just pose some probably perhaps statements. I think these are perhaps important for um, conferences like this, and particularly with the, the number of students that we have here, just to to get people thinking, um, and, and, and no one is here at this conference, but particularly on the healthcare issue, 
trying to sell a certain side or sell a certain piece of legislation, but this conference, as any conference should be, is just a design to get you to think. So when I sat down and I tried to deal with the issue of transition and deal with healthcare and transition, the two terms, I came up with some real life situations that I've actually seen. I'll leave names out and people out, but these are, are real life situations, and you can see how the healthcare reform legislation can or cannot apply to them and how it should be changed or not. And, and I like some comments from the panel. And, and the first is a middle-aged worker who has multiple sclerosis. Um, she's afraid she's going to lose her job or she may have to move to another job. And the question becomes, would she lose her health insurance because she will not be insured again because as the senator was talking about, a pre-existing condition moving on to a new employer. And this person is a professional, yet this person has multiple sclerosis, and that's a big concern under the existing health care. The other one is a school teacher, again, a middle-aged woman. She has rheumatoid arthritis. She has thousands of dollars a month that she has to pay because her health insurance plan recently decided not to cover the medications that she was taking. Now she's left with the decision to quit her job because she has to qualify for public health insurance to pay for her medication. The next example is an autistic individual, 25 years old. He wants to accept a job at a small business, but the additional income would exceed what he's allowed under the government called SSI income limits, and therefore he can't afford health care if he goes and gets the job, he can't afford to take the job because he loses health care. So it's a catch-22. These are all real-life situations that people, a lot of our ages, are, are facing under the existing health care system. And I would like some comment from our panel. I, I'm sure these are issues that, that they run into, at least on the fringes. Anyone want to go first? I, yeah. I'd Mr. Like Buff? Take, I'd like to take that. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter if you're talking about health care or any of these issues like SSI or, or uh, how many dollars they, they can or can't make or whether or not the employment isn't competitive or, or supported. What, what happens is, is it, regardless of the, of the issue that you're speaking about, when you talk about the issue of civil rights, what, what comes down to is, is we really need to find ways that, and when I talked before about these partnerships, the most frustrating thing about some of the partnerships that we have is that the rules actually constrain us from leveling the playing field for all people. And I think that what has to happen is, is I think by passing these kinds of legislation, what we're hoping to see accomplished is the leveling of the playing field. So uh, once you pass this kind of legislation, that is no longer an issue. And what happens is, is because of the constraints that are in varied guidelines, and, and OVR has certain constraints, education has certain constraints, employers have certain constraints, the healthcare system itself has certain constraints, but every time we try to uh, prepare students or, or adults or people with disabilities to be able to be competitively employed and successfully transition to adult life, with, with whatever areas they choose, we're so often faced with those kind of constraints that are, are inherent in the way the system operates. And, and what we've actually had discussions about is the need to uh, actually break the rules. And I think we need to break the rules and we need to start saying to ourselves, it doesn't make sense. We've argued this issue for repeatedly. It, it breaks our heart in education to have done what we've done so many times for students, to have active partnerships and, and I want to compliment uh, Mr. Gannon and, and the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation in Pennsylvania in particular. What they've done, in, and, I, and I think Michael's seen this because I've certainly worked with Michael for years, what they've done to advance uh, the, the ability to transition students with disabilities into the workplace in support of educational efforts has been phenomenal. I want to thank you guys for that because uh, that's been huge. And so everywhere you go, you should see things that are partnerships from OVR. But the reality is, is that if we don't break the rules and, and, and find ways to, to overcome these issues by having legislation that actually levels the playing field, 
so that they're no longer issues, then we're constantly gonna be faced with this. We prepare students to transition to adult life in many programs that are funded by education in partnership with OBR, only to find them turn age 21 or 18 and graduate, and the supports for these students aren't there because of the constraints of the system. And actually, in many cases, it becomes counterproductive in terms of access to other services for students to seek employment. So therefore, like the point you made with the SSI, uh, is that they, they're, it's actually counterproductive, so they may in fact want to not work. And when your choice, and I, and I think that these are the kind of, they're, they're really ethical dilemmas, because the choice becomes which of the greater goods we choose, because they're, they're, they're both, we wanna do the right things for people, but sometimes it's hard when you wanna do the right things to get them competitively employed, but then the constraint says if you do that, then they're going to lose, lose these benefits. And uh, until we pass legislation, and until we get agencies that have the governmental flexibility to uh, look at issues, not in a black and white world, but in a gray world that you're actually trying to, to uh, figure out what's going to allow the most amount of success, we're constantly going to be ha having to make that Sophie's Choice type of, a, uh, of an option for a student. And every one of those that you mentioned, and in fact, if the level of field, if, if we listen to what his healthcare said, if uh, pre-existing condition wasn't an issue, if SSI wasn't an issue, then employers would be saying, I can do these things. But every time an employer sits down with somebody that has those issues, they have to weigh those factors. And as long as they have to weigh those factors, they're not going to get the equal opportunity that everybody else in this country enjoys. Any other? Um if you have a question, could I please ask you to come to the microphone? Sure. I, I just want to have everybody hear you, okay? Hi, I'm Janelle Miller, placement counselor with the Harrisburg OVR office. I just wanted to make a comment. That's a great comment. Very great comment. But I also want to make one comment to you. Um, Pennsylvania, if anybody knows this, I'm sure most of you do know, Pennsylvania has insurance to help with Medicaid. It's called Medical Assistance for Workers with Disabilities Through Welfare. And many of our customers and many people will qualify for that even if they're already working. Um, most of the customers who he described probably qualify unless they, they don't uh, have that 250% of their poverty level. Anyway, we won't go into that, any of that. But, um, most customers are going to qualify for that, so they're going to be able to get insurance even if they're already working. So we have that. I'm sorry to say that. This is what I was dying to say, MOD. So, so for the students who don't know about that program, Pennsylvania does have a program to help people get insurance while they're working. That's all. Again, it, a lot depends upon your income, though. Yeah. Go but ahead. Minus, Another question. Minus deductions. Right. I was one. I was happy to hear about the increase in the um, income limit for Medicaid in, in terms of going up to 135 percent. But what I would like to see in regards to the MOD program is for that income limit to be waived. That if you were at one point an SSI or SSDI recipient um, and you meet those guidelines for uh, definition of, of a person with a disability regardless of how much money you're making, that you can be assured to, to maintain medical benefits. And that, you pay a premium based upon your income. So that, that does support things. Um, from a VR perspective, too, the best things that have happened in the past 10 years have been the um, inception of benefits counseling programs through the Social Security Administration and the Medicaid buy-in program. So if we can see an expansion in those types of services um, through whether it's health care reform or um, social security reform or what have you, I think that you're going to continue to see an increase in people who are tax consumers becoming tax payers. Uh, can I chip in? Yes, Mr. Gannon. 
I just wanted to say that uh, I'm glad MOD was brought up. It's, a, it's an excellent program, and it probably would have applied maybe to the autism scenario that you raised. Uh, oh, however, in, a, in our current system, I think the other scenarios are the person's between a rock and a hard place, and, and I don't think there is any easy answer, and I don't think anybody can make it easy in our current, uh, in our current uh, medical situation. Uh, I, I've already said my piece on universality, but I think what we're going to see happen in Washington is we're not going to see a fix-all health care bill uh, finally enacted. I think what we're going to see is we're going to see a bill that, that puts in the correct boxes certain fixes to certain problems with the hope of, uh, of addressing universality uh, and, and a common system in the long run and trying to fix the major boxes in the short run. And I hope, I hope we move in that direction because I believe that as we address the, the most prominent problem issues and resolve them, it will become easier and easier to start talking about common levels of care and universal coverage. And, and I think, again, solely my uh, uh, inappropriate and unvaluable opinion, but it is my opinion all the same that what we're going to see is, uh, is a partial resolve uh, moving towards a long-term resolve uh, that will require additional legislation. Any other questions from the audience? Mrs. Leahy? Thank you. 
one other question. Go ahead, ma'am. Yes. Um, my name is Rita DeLeo. I'm a faculty member at the University of Scranton, but my background is clinical, so I've been 30 years in healthcare. And so often in the recent past, patients have said, it's a choice between prescriptions, food, heat for my house. It's awful how many times that happens. So, Mr. Gannon, when you say, well, those aren't issues for people with wealth. I came here to listen to Senator Casey, and I got a lot of good information out of that. But one of my main questions was going to be on Medicare Part D, which he did address. However, he said 50% reduction. And I'm just compelled to say this. That is not enough. You talk about attorney uh, real life stories. Middle-aged patient, stage four cancer, who's paid into traditional health care entire life. As soon as she was unable to work and pay the premium, lost the benefit, forced to go on Medicaid. Due to her age, does not qualify for Social Security benefits, therefore has a limited income. This past weekend, she presented to the ER with possible pneumonia. The doctor said there was no reason to keep her, discharged her with three meds. Now, she does have Medicare Part D, went to the pharmacy. The copay on every one of them was $120. $360, there's no way that patient can afford them. So often, the drugs are not covered by Medicare Part D. So we carry patients through the healthcare system, we treat them, we see them in the hospital, see them in the ER, but then when we discharge them and say, go get your meds, they can't afford them. We're losing them. Unfortunately, I look at, that's a death sentence. These patients go through everything, all the money we spend on diagnosing, but then really, we're not serving them well. So, Mr. Buss, when you talk about breaking the rules, trust me, as a healthcare professional, I wish I could figure out a way to. So really, it's more than a comment than a question, but Mr. and Mrs. Leahy, if there was a way for you to bring that back to Capitol Hill, that it's not just the pharmaceutical companies given a 50% reduction, it's also <laughs> that the health benefits need to cover a larger list on the formulary, because especially patients chronically ill and not all elderly, many young patients can't get the meds that they need to live day to day. So thank you. Thank you. Perhaps in um, quick follow-up to what, unless someone else has a quick follow-up to what Mrs. Leahy was saying, <clears throat> um, that, that health reform legislation that Senator Casey was talking about specifically, which is the most important section, 2706 addresses the discrimination issue. And let me just read to you what it says. <clears throat> it says, in issuing health insurance policies, insurers will not be permitted to establish terms of coverage based on an applicant's health status, medical condition, including physical and mental illness, claims experience, prior receipt of health care, medical history, genetic information, evidence of insurability, such as being a victim of domestic violence or disability. So I, I think it's important what the senator mentioned with the health legislation, and that's where the word discrimination comes from, that particular section. And I believe that was passed sometime in the latter part of uh, July of, um, of this summer. And, and Senator Casey is on, is on that committee of health education, labor, and pensions, just so just so you are aware of that and how, how timely he was to be here today. Ironically, tomorrow in, um, in um, Washington is advocacy day in the Senate. There was one on September 30th and tomorrow's October 8th and there's, there's one tomorrow again. And I'm, I'm a member of the National Down Syndrome Conference and email is great because you can learn all this stuff from emails. And um, I just got an email the other day reminding me of that and reminding me of the class act that he was talking about, how important it is. And there's kind of a, 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 an offshoot of that called the community life, community first choice option as well though. And, and it all has to deal with what we were talking about at lunch today, a lot having to do with the, as people call it, and I'm just taking words that are out there, the institutional biasness of, of Medicaid. And, and I just like, if, if the panel, if, if they want to comment on that, where the government will give you all this money, I'll use the most common example, to stay in a nursing home. They'll give you six, seven thousand dollars. But they will not, they will not give the consumer that six or seven thousand dollars to provide the care to someone. That's just one example. 
Um, and that's one of the things that the Class Act goes into and addresses is the community issues. And that can apply to getting a wheelchair, or that can apply to be able to get out of the house somehow. They'll give you services here, but they won't give you there. And we, we had this discussion briefly at lunch, and I, I like any of the panel members if they want to comment on that. Mr. Gannon? Well, having been one of those that mouthed off at lunch on the issue, I'm more than happy to contribute. The, 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 the real issue is uh, <coughs> money following the consumer. Uh, whatever is being consumed, whether it's uh, long-term care, uh, a wheelchair, uh, a pharmaceutical, whatever. Once a price has been put on a service uh, and, and the, the service is deemed necessary for the individual, the individual ought to be empowered to, uh, to get the best deal they can to resolve that problem. Uh, with the uh, issue of durable medical equipment, oftentimes, you know, I mean, we're making decisions the way they were made in the 1800s today. Uh, today we have an internet. Uh, almost anybody sitting in their own home can shop and find the, uh, the item or items they need. Uh, and uh, if, their, if their physician agrees with them, their therapist agrees with them, and it's signed off on, they ought to then be able to buy that product uh, the cheapest way they can find it. And a wheelchair alone, the cost of having to go through a, a third party provider and pay setup fees and evaluation fees that, that, that most people with chronic disability deal with on their own anyway, doubles the price of the wheelchair. And, and then we have the system telling the consumer, you're a heavy cost to carry. Well, we wouldn't be a heavy cost to carry if you'd let us handle our own purchases. And uh, I, I think one of the long-term uh, savings, if we're, if we're going to look at culling the system and looking for every uh, dollar and every value, is going to be to, to let the resources track the consumer and make the consumer responsible of getting the best deal they can get to meet their needs, to truly meet their needs, not tell them through COBRA health insurance that they're going to have coverage when they can't buy their pharmaceuticals or they split pills in half because they can't afford all of it. You know, that's not health care. Saying you have COBRA coverage doesn't cut it. You've, you've, got to, you've got to offer the consumer an opportunity to be responsible for themselves and, and track the best purchase they can get to solve their problem. Mr. Buff? Yeah, I actually want to try to take that comment and reference it to something that Mrs. Lady said. <clears throat> and I know that this is an, uh, a, law, a law course or a law conference, but uh, when legislators pass legislation, they, they pass it typically because it's for the greater good of, of, the, of the citizens. And they try to do the best they can, and, it's, it, it, and it all, almost always falls short, short initially. And, and, and uh, so I'm going to use special education as an example of that. <clears throat> when you look at how the, the evolution of special education beginning, and I know that many of you here, when I'm looking at this youth here, didn't, weren't in practice in 75. Uh, but in 1975, when they passed I, uh, no, uh, 94142, was an infancy of, of the law that, and, and what, so I, I just want to impress the youth here that there's an evolutionary cycle of law that occurs. Legislators pass things, with, and, they, and they pass them without knowing all the ramifications, because it, it's not possible to know all the ramifications of what's going to occur before you pass a bill. Or it'll never get into anything through legislation. I think it's slowing out. What do you see if you have to figure everything out before it happens? So they pass it with very, very good intention for the benefit of its citizens. And then after they do, we get into, I think, what happens in some of this. What we should have is we need challenges, uh, court challenges. And I think that this is, I actually think that this healthcare is just the beginning. And I think if we can get legislation through, then what has to happen is we then need to start having court challenges that build a body of case law. And what happens is, is in between 94 and 42 and 1975, and the passage of IDEA, in 1986, you had a body of cases that were heard that became then the things that were considered the next time they passed the legislation. And then they did that again in 97, and they did that again to where we are now in 2004. So if you study in any of your coursework, 
the evolution of special education from 75 to 2004, what you'll find is the cycle is legislation, case law, they review the case law for the next legislation, improve legislation, more case law, and that cycle continues. So what I'm hoping is that if we get some kind of, of, of a compromise that benefits us, and then we start to argue things like this. I mean, I just went through a personal experience recently that was similar to that, where I could have bought something for literally 30% of the cost that I was actually, my insurance company was actually charged, but since they were paying for it, but, but and I was told, but if I paid for it myself, and the insurance company rejected it, they would give it to me at this price. And it was 30% less than the actual value of the product. And I think if, if we can get legislation passed, and then we can move into where we can start to stretch using strategy as a stretch to make change, then what I'm hoping is in this evolutionary cycle, you'll see improved, because it, it is hard. I feel, you know, when you talk about breaking the rules, the reality is, is until we can get people to use some common sense approach, it's almost like that government's paying $150 for a hammer uh, type thing. Uh, so I do appreciate your comments, but I do think you need to keep in mind that cycle, that this is the beginning. And until we get some type of a universal health care passed with its flaw, all of its inherent flaws, that will allow us to have the discussion of how we can argue about improving it the next time. But right now, we don't even have that. So, you know, that's where I'm trying to come from. Get something here, and then we'll argue about how we can improve it. That'll build up that, that body of case law. And just to, to make a comment, and, and I think, again, a lot of young folks sitting out there, but I, I deal day to day with a lot of families, a lot of youth. Um, and even just having an understanding of what everybody is saying here, and I'm sure your heads are swimming around with all these numbers and laws and rules. What I find is oftentimes, even if an individual young person is able to access health care, they don't have a good enough understanding of even what the law is to do that. So as you're there and as you are working with families and your practices and once you guys graduate, really do get a grasp of it and then work with the folks that are your partners. You know, if you're, if you're an OT or a PT, that you're working with the education folks and the healthcare people. And there really is this collaborative effort to get the information to the folks that need it. Um, I, I think that knowledge and empowerment piece, and, and I guess that's the thing when I listen to all this stuff, with the laws, I hope to heavens it gets down to the point that somebody could actually understand what their benefits are. Um, because that, to me, is one of the biggest problems that still exists even as we move forward with this stuff. So anyhow. Yeah, and, and perhaps in follow-up to that, I think he hit the, the key word was uh, education. And ironically, um, parts in the healthcare legislation address the education of the physicians, the, edu the education of the therapists, and the education of, of the nurses. Um, the ARC and, and UCP, Association of Retired Citizens, and, and United Cerebral Palsy are big proponents of the education issue and educating the physicians and the doctors. Right down the street, we have a, a new medical school going, going up, um, Commonwealth Medical College. They may very well have particular courses that have to deal with educating um, regarding dealing with people with educational, with intellectual disabilities. And if it all washes out right, federal funding may be dependent upon those schools having those programs, educating them, and it falls just into place with um, being able to access. I mean, we used that word before, the accessibility to, to a building, let alone to, to the doctor. They talk about allowing um, people with disabilities to have more time with the doctor. We've all been to the doctor. We know you have to have your notes. You have to have all your questions. You're all nervous. Can you imagine someone going in who can't communicate? Can you imagine someone going in who needs a sign language interpreter? Um, it's just, it, it's enormous, the, the, the problems. And that all affects the health care, and there's a big trickle down from that, obviously. Um, perhaps we should just spend a couple of minutes going into um, a couple of the transition issues, strictly the transition issues. There were some great, great presentations today, and, and I learned a lot, and I'd like just perhaps to go across the table as, as, as we kind of kind of wind up. Um, Michael told me about something I never heard at. He's the transition guy with, um, with Fatan, and he talked about Pennsylvania's community 
of practice, which I, I, I understand is um, a model now for the country um, about transition and having young people with disabilities succeed after school, getting them prepared for it and that. And I'd just like to share with you um, some of that, perhaps most importantly, given the number of students we have here today. Michael? Sure. Um, back, in, it was in 2002, um, Pennsylvania uh, was approached, it was actually um, through uh, the National Association of State Directors of Special Education, uh, Educators, um, Directors, uh, about this concept of working collaboratively with other agencies. And I, I kind of alluded to this before. Uh, but in the past, to be honest, I don't know if Mr. Gannon and I would be sitting up here at this same table at this particular conference. Uh, because really, VR folks, OVR folks kind of did their thing, education did their thing, healthcare did their thing. Uh, the folks with um, Office of Developmental Programs, they did their separate silos. And nobody really was communicating or looking at how to work collaboratively. Uh, back in 2002, we really started to look at this differently. Uh, we did have some signed agreements and documents, some legal documents saying we were all going to play together. But basically, we were still playing together, but we were all in our separate little bumper cars, for lack of a better word. Where we have moved in our state is really to work collaboratively. Um, and it's not just with the folks at the agency state level. Um, in our state currently, uh, we have a, a, what's called a state leadership team. So we do have representations uh, from the Department of Education, Health, Labor and Industry, uh, and the Department of Welfare. But we also have stakeholders represented. Uh, we have a large number of youth, a large number of families, as well as advocacies and provider groups. That's an important piece. But I think the more effective, and really what affects you all, is that the communities of practice then filters down. Uh, so it does get down to the local practitioners. And I had mentioned uh, OT, PT, rehab folks that are in the audience or will be soon once you graduate. Um, we really do get to the level of where are you? And how can you work collaboratively? And how can we share our resources, our talents? Um, because ultimately, we're working at one individual that we're trying to assist and help. Um, we've been bannering around lately the term the whole individual. But it's basically, everyone is working collaboratively. Education, we do IEPs. Uh, VR does IWPs. Um, DPW does an individual support plan. And oftentimes, and I used to sit as a transition coordinator at meetings, and we were all doing separate plans. Nobody was looking at that individual. And oftentimes, nobody was sitting there with that young person and saying, what do you want to do, or their family. And I think what the community of practice in our state does, and really what we have worked towards, is to combine those efforts. So we are, the, the, uh, I think Senator Casey used the, he was using a, a, like a football term. I, I think we really look at that young person as the quarterback, and the rest of us are the players that are helping that individual score. And, and what they're scoring is their outcomes that they're going to achieve once they leave school. So that's really, and I think it's an excellent model. Um, we, we've seen a lot of results. As a result of working collaboratively, we were able to get grants. We've been able to really promote uh, successful outcomes for kids. We're still a long way to go, but you guys are entering the field at a really good time. I wish this was 25 years ago and I was sitting where you were because it would be much easier to go and do the job that we have. And, and Mr. Buss, if you could just comment on, and you did, you did before, but I, I think it's crucial, and again, I'm going to kind of hone in on, on the students and particularly being a, a father of a special need child, um, about the expectations that you need to set for people with disabilities, about setting the bar high, yet at the same time being realistic. And I think everyone has touched on that in their presentations today, but how important that is. Well, if I could leave you with one thing, and, and, and I want to echo Michael's comments because, you know, this is, I'm, I often laugh with our staff. I'm in my 37th year, 37th year of service, so I'm eligible to retire two years ago. Uh, and I like what I'm doing as much now as I did, maybe probably more than I did when I started. And if there's one thing I would tell you that I believe that is our responsibility if we decide to enter into this realm, and inevitably the single most important question that's on any of your inter future interviews is why did you choose what you're doing as a profession? Inevitably, people say they want to make a difference in the lives of the students that they work with. 
So if I can leave you with one thing that I believe should be our mantra as to what we can do with students, whether it's passage of the health care or the, re the reauthorization of, of our legislation or the trying to break down the barriers with these constraints that, you know, breaking the rules with these constraints that we have, and I don't think we can necessarily do that, but trying to stretch those, is we have a responsibility in the role of advocacy. And I think in the role of advocacy, if you really embrace that, you become partners with the people and the students that need to uh, do the things that are necessary to move the system forward and do the, the best possible thing for every single student that you work with. And in so doing, that's where we get the, benefit, the enjoyment out of what we do. And uh, so my whole thing is, is that I think we should have high expectations for students from the very beginning. The, you know, the moment we meet with them, we should be advocating for them. Uh, I've been doing this a long time, and I often marveled when parents would say, or teachers would call up and they'd say, oh my God, they're bringing an advocate with them. We need you at this conference. And I'd say, I get along with advocates, because that's our job. We're supposed to be advocates. So, you know, I think that when you actually have people coming that some people view as adversarial, there's something wrong with that. I think what we should be viewing is the more people that come and look at issues differently that can give us possible, di possibly different ideas to the solution, they, we should welcome that, we should embrace that. So if I can leave you with one thing to think about for the future is that it's our responsibility for those who choose to do this for a living to embrace the role of advocacy for the, for the people that we choose, uh, have, have the pleasure and the privilege to serve because it really is. It's our privilege and it's our pleasure to be able to work with these students and uh, embrace that role. And, and if I may just have uh, Mr. Gannon and Ms. Patterson, both with the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, just comment briefly on, on, on the gist or the, the, one of the, I find it the most important part of their um, presentation today on, on, on two um, programs going on. Number one, is a program called Project Search. It's out of Children's Hospital of Cincinnati. And another program called Project Promoting Academic Success, I believe through Allegheny College, um, which is basically a collaborative effort of the schools, the businesses, the community, and vocational rehabilitation um, to get people employed and, and how important it is. And it's an available resource out there, and you should know about it. Ms. Patterson? All right. Thanks. You want me to just briefly review the two programs? Sure. Okay. Um, there are two really fantastic programs. Project Search is one that is primarily targeting uh, individuals that are looking to go into employment immediately after leaving high school, and it's um, it's immersion in the workforce. It's typically I'm not sure how much detail you would like, but. Um, and I can certainly speak to anyone afterwards that wants additional details, or um, you can get our cards and contact us, and we'd be thrilled to tell you more. Uh, PASS, yes, PASS is Promoting Academic Success, and that is a program for students that are considering going on to, to education, to post-secondary education. And it did begin, you are correct, it did begin with the um, Allegheny Community College it, in conjunction with the Pittsburgh District Office. And we now have um, programs throughout the state um, on multiple campuses, and we have more programs in development. It's very exciting. Learn lots of um, great skills and just help them determine whether or not that is, is the correct path to take. Any, any? Thank you, that's good. Anything okay. else, Mr. Gannon? I think this is a, a final round of getting towards a wrap-up here, so I'm just going to give you my wrap-up. And my wrap-up is, you've, you've seen that we're angry as uh, you can get about a lot of things. I know that you're angry about a lot of things. And I can tell every student in here, as you, as you pursue your career in various fields, that crap is going to happen through your whole life. There's always going to be some idiot that's going to give the wrong answer to the right question. Uh, uh, and there's, you know, 
there's always going to be something that's going to drive you down and make you mad as you can possibly be. But there is nothing, there is absolutely nothing more valuable than knowing that on a one-on-one -on -one relationship with another human being, you're making a change in their life, you're improving their life, and when you go home at night, you'll know that you did that. And there is absolutely nothing better unless it's running an organization made up of hundreds of people that do that every day and knowing that you're helping facilitate them to do it. So I, I encourage you all to move ahead, all of you to remain as angry as you can possibly be and in the face of everybody you can get in the face of uh, and be happy in your work. Um, I, I guess this brings the conference to a conclusion, and, and let me just make a real um, brief and, and, and quick comment. Um, I, I think as the panel mentioned, it, it's an issue, the health care, the transition issue, particularly the health care, is, is something we just have to be patient with. Um, we have to wait. There's not going to be a lot of answers to our questions quickly. I think but the important thing is that we're, we're discussing it. Um, no more so than we discussing just the issue of disability. When I went to high school, you just didn't use the D word. Um, you didn't have kids with disability in the same class with you. Um, we, uh, I, I lived in an environment where kids were made, made fun of. We, it, it's, just so, it's just come so far. And like Mr. Blas said, the transition of the cases and the new laws that take effect, the transition has to go for people with disability. Kids in high school, kids in college now, in, invite them in, and it's changing, changing the world tremendously. And, and I think because of that happening, we're sitting here having a discussion today about not including pre, uh, taking out pre-existing conditions in any policies and making sure the, dis, uh, the, the disabled are covered. So if anything, I think we're successful in that we brought all these people together to at least talk it through and, and to, to move on and, and be here another day to talk about it. So thank you, everybody, and thanks to the Leahy's for inviting all of us. <laughs> thanks to the panel. And just a couple of closing announcements. Uh, before those announcements, though, Barbara and I would like to add our thanks to everyone who participated in this conference in any way. Uh, most especially Mr. and Mrs. Leahy, to our panel tonight, and to our moderator, Attorney Grady, thank you. And thank you for those that spoke at the events today. We appreciate your expertise. To all of you, we appreciate your interest through this session and throughout the day. As you're going home, we wanted to remind you that the shuttle will continue to run continuously until 7 p.m. Um, also, if you were a conference goer during the day, we would appreciate it if you would fill out the evaluation form. There's a box that's covered in purple when you leave, if you would just kindly leave that evaluation form in the box. And finally, um, we would like to say good night, and also there are refreshments in the back of the room. Please help yourself, and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.